billions and billions of dollars every single year I expended, expended and also spent in this particular field. It's a massive, massive industry helping people to deal with anxiety and, of course, depression. How many, I don't know, Prozac is one of them. And I, I can't even think of the names of the medication. Prozac's the big seller, of course, and there's lots of other varieties of it. It's a massive, massive industry. Today, my friends, you are going to be learning, if you don't already know, learning about a bit more about anxiety, the root causes of anxiety, the symptoms, some of the symptoms, why they really happen, how to tackle them at a deep and profound level, as well as a symptomatic level. I uh, created a course about five years ago, uh, ago called Managing Anxiety with Ease, and I launched that on Udemy. I had about four and a half thousand people do it without even having to promote it and got, you know, top rated uh, reviews. But I also learned something that a lot of people with anxiety actually will not take the action that is necessary. Every one body wants to pop a quick pill and think it's going to go away. And it doesn't work like that. So welcome to the Harun Rabani podcast and uh, Harun Rabani show. And today, once again, I'm joined by my good friend, Dr. Ashish Paul. Ashish, welcome back to the podcast. Good evening, Harun. And good evening to everybody who's watching us live on the replay. And it is fun uh also as we have a bit of banter when we talk about issues because otherwise it's it's becomes too dense yeah um you know and um but yeah we are here to discuss today about anxiety seems to be the modern day epidemic um shouldn't use that word but it is um you know i know when i go to holly street uh, my clinic at holly street it's two <laughs> two main practitioners there one is anti-anxiety specialist number two is the lip fillers and all of those so either cosmetic or this one so it is it's just it boggles my mind because i'm not a an anxious person so i when i see somebody who is suffering from anxiety it's just really it breaks my heart to see that where we can do so much naturally but so many people are suffering from anxiety so Let's talk about that. Yeah, so a lot of people would think, you know, if only a few people get anxiety. And like you mentioned, you, you're you not generally a, a, an anxious person. Neither am I, except when I got traumatized a few years ago. And I won't go on about that. And I swear to you, I kid you not, I was showing all the symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. And it's not nice. It is an absolute horrible, horrible experience. However, that those are symptoms and that's the challenge for people is to recognize that the symptoms are pulling you and telling you to pay attention to something which is much more deeper and we're going to talk about that the statistics say of course that there's about 8 million people in the UK with anxiety it was absolutely bs because they're the people with serious anxiety issues however since yeah. the beginning of 2020 there's something been going on in the globe something that's upset a few people, something that stopped people from leaving their houses, something that has pitted father against son, mother against daughter, yeah. over the whole controversy of injecting themselves with drugs that haven't been tested. And you know what? The whole entire world is anxious. You mentioned lip fillers. Well, why does somebody feel like they need a lip filler? Something about themselves they're not happy with which makes them anxious which then makes them take the lip filler same with bodybuilding and uh, i've been someone who's been going to the gym since 1984 as a in order to supplement my 85 actually in order to supplement my martial arts and what i found was that a large proportion of people who are absolutely caught up in the whole bodybuilding craze they overly crazy about weightlifting is because they've got issues which is to do with their own insecurities it doesn't mean you shouldn't go to the gym let me just clarify that so let's begin with a few of the symptoms because there's i'll give you my definition in a moment but how, how do you see how would you define anxiety from an ayurvedic or a medical perspective ashish uh, how do i define it, it it is to do with how your mind is so People who have got very, very active mind and active imagination when it goes overboard uh, and when you do not have 
the ways to balance it because you don't know enough about um actually most of people don't even know that they're imbalanced that's the thing that's the thing about many diseases when we look at it from a holistic perspective that they don't know that their anxiety is causing their gut issues they don't know that their anxiety is causing their backache they don't know that their anxiety is causing their period problems they don't know that their anxiety is causing their fertility issues so people have no idea that there is a link you know yeah um so from ayurvedic uh, point of view uh, i will talk about a little bit later it's it's to do with how your mind is and we have three types of uh, qualities of mind so one is uh satvik mind which is very stable calm content then there is rajasic mind and there is tamasic mind so rajasic mind is the mind which is playful it's active it's doing things and when it does not rest when it does not balance uh that's when we have issues to do with anxiety so that's what ayurveda or yoga says about it so so in the definition of anxiety in in essence now, this is the psychological definition, I guess. In essence, it's about how people are perceiving reality and mm. it's how their body is responding to the perception. Remember, the word is perception. That mm. means it's mind-related. However, anxiety isn't just caused by what you see. It's also a lot to do with what you're tasting. And you mentioned about gut issues. If you put into your body something that not, is not aligned to your gut, it's going to make your body anxious. And when your body's anxious, yeah. your mind is going to be anxious. So, you know, in some respects, anxiety, I have to say, I mean, I've been through it. It's, it's it, the worst version of it. In some respects, for most people, it's actually very curable naturally without resorting to drugs freely. You can do it for free. But that means... You have to take responsibility yeah. to not play the victim. I'm not saying you're victims, by the way. Not play the victim role yeah. and say, you know what? I'm going to do what it takes and I'm going to follow guidance because it usually has to be from an outside, whether it's free or paid. Um, you follow guidance step by step and you will shift it. So, again, once again, it's about perceived reality. And so people might say, well, what's the difference between an anxiety attack and a panic attack, just to clarify that. So an anxiety attack is something where you're perceiving something is happening or will more likely is going to happen. It's always about the future, by the way. There's a hint already. It's about the future. Panic is just a trigger. With all, it's Meaning it's just a response. You don't even have to think about it. So anxiety is back to the mind. Now, if you look at the vast majority of people with mental health challenges or even chronic diseases, you will see it's to do with lifestyle choices and where they pay attention to. As an example, if you're growing up like I did, if you're growing up watching the news and the news, at least in the UK and the US and most of the world, to be honest with you, particularly Bangladeshi, Indian and Pakistani news, by the way, it's all about create, getting you to feel anxious, stressed, worried as an example so my father bengali i was born in bangladesh as well he's been in the uk since the 50s and he's been watching the news and all the shenanigans and all the trouble that's going on and he's been doing that particularly since satellite television in the uk since the late 80s 90s so 90s 30 years let's call it that do you know what an impact my dad had on watching this news about bangladesh stuff going on Zero. Do you know how much impact it's had on his health? How much has gotten worse since watching the news? Several thousand percent. Uh, there's a bit of an imbalance going on. Yeah. So let, 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 let's talk about, uh, we talk about body constitution quite frequently. Let's talk about body constitution. Is there a particular type of constitution that is more predisposed to anxiety and one which is less? Uh, yes, so my favorite topic <laughs> about body and mind constitution as uh, according to Ayurvedic medicine, mm -hmm. it is vata, pitta, kapha. So vata people are more like ether and air, pitta people are more like fire and kapha people are more like earth and water. So you can imagine the 
you know, qualities of these uh, elements or what we call the five elements of the universe. So Vata people or wherever there is more Vata involved, there will be more anxiety. Nervous system will be more activated. Nervous system is more activated in Vata people. Uh, so any foods, any lifestyle, any thought that is uh, increasing your Vata, that is making your nervous system unstable, is going to create anxiety. So to say Vata people are generally more predisposed to anxiety uh, as compared to Pitta and Kapha. Pitta, a little bit less, they are anxious, then they become angry because that's, you know, the fire starts to play in. Um, and with Kapha people, they become anxious and then they become depressed because they have more earth, earth equality. So that's how it plays in with the constitutions. Uh, but where, whenever you feel that even if you have, uh, say, I have a lot of Kapha in me, so people who have got a lot of Kapha stability, but sometimes they are thinking, okay, today my mind is a little bit racy. So you have to look at what did I eat? How did I sleep? Did I pass tools or not? Uh, and what ha have I been thinking for the last couple of days because of which my mind is affected today? So nervous system is affected uh, whenever there is anxiety and we need to uh, look into our constitution, understand our body and mind constitution really, really well. We also have to look at, as we always talk about, how were you raised as a kid? Okay, what environment you had? Or if not then, then at some point, if you have become anxious in the past few years, what has happened uh, in those years? How have you learned this behavior to become more anxious? Of course, there are life situations where one can become anxious as well. Um, but there will be, again, the choices, whether you drive yourself mad with that anxiety or you do actively something to reduce it. Uh, you know, so it is all about learning your body and mind behavior, constitution, and then act accordingly. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, you're watching the <laughs> Harun Rubani podcast. And uh, if you have a question, by the way, you got two very experienced therapists, a medical doctor, and I'm a therapist and a healer. You got two very experienced people here. If you have a question relating to anxiety, please use this as an opportunity to ask, and we will help to the best of our ability. Make your question as specific as possible, and we can help. Also, also, got news for yourselves. Um, we feel, both uh, Ashish and I, um, this show has been going really well. We've certainly you know, enjoyed the banter and sharing. So... In September, it might even be October, we are going to be launching a brand new podcast. Same two people, brand new podcasts on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, etc. All the good channels. And it's going to be called The Natural Medicine Podcast. I've not announced it before because, because I wanted to make sure all the domain names and everything has been purchased so nobody runs off with it. So if you would like to learn how to address different issues of your life, mental health, physical health, then type into the comments right now, natural medicine or natural medicine podcast. And what I'll do is I'll make sure you get messaged when we're ready to launch. We haven't set a date yet. We just want to make sure we've got at least uh, a few hundred of you saying yes, and then we will launch. I would love your help, of course, uh, to help us share this message out because, you know, my friends, the truth is that over the last two, three decades, and this has been an ongoing thing, that governments have been playing silly games. Corporations have been playing silly games at the expense of the individual, at the expense of the public. The National Health Service in the UK is breaking down. The American health system is a total joke. And Canada, I don't know where they are. I mean, they're stuck. I mean, that's just, that's just three countries. And there are even many more countries, many, many more, who don't even have free health education, free health system. Dr. Ashish and I, I am from the medical devices background, functional medicine. I also very much respect and practice within my lifestyle anyway, uh, Eastern um, medicine. And Dr. Ashish, of course, spans both areas, but as a medical doctor. So if you have any question, make sure you type it uh, below and then we will keep you informed so all right so we've got is there let's talk about specific foods that what? might actually make people anxious do you want to start and i'll throw in my two pennies worth as well <laughs> absolutely 
Uh, my uh, all that I'm sharing is it is from Ayurvedic perspective. So it it is um, and modern as well. Wherever I can substantiate certain, you know, from modern scientific perspective. Not that Ayurveda is not scientific, but it is holistic science. Um, so it is the foods that will increase the vata. So cold, dry foods of any kind. So salads, for example, you have salad. We know it produces a lot of wind in the stomach. So wind will then cause more disturbance with the nervous system. Uh, and hence the vata will be more in your body. Uh, so that is one specific food. Yeah. So, so, so with salads in the health world, of course, vegan world, plant-based world, they're constantly promoting raw fruits and salads. I love my salads. So are you saying we shouldn't have salads at all? What are you saying? No, that's that's where we need to learn our balance. That's where we need to learn our body mind constitution, how much vata you are. OK, so somebody could probably eat a whole cucumber and not suffer from vata. And somebody probably could only have small bite and still feel a lot of wind. OK, so that is why you have to understand where your body constitution is, how much vata you already are. So find out about your body and mind constitution first. So fill in the questionnaire that we're going to share the link and find out how and where and how much combination and it takes a while to understand that how much uh, salads for example you can take but we know for example all the green vegetables the cruciferous vegetables you know they all produce wind all the dals for example the pulses they produce wind that's why we cook cook them for so long because otherwise and that is one of the reasons um the plant-based diet or people who have uh what is it called you know, the uh, raw diet yeah, is, raw food. is quite difficult to digest for most people, especially people who have got vata stomach. So you need to add a lot of spices to it to calm it down to for your body to be able to digest it. Otherwise, you will feel that. And vata is not just only, you know, it's affecting your nervous system. It actually is affecting inside, uh, can give you symptoms like heart you know heart attack or palpitations because there is so much wind that you then cannot control mm. so i'm not a huge fan of um complete road uh, diet you need some cooked food in your diet or you need lots and lots of spices to calm that vata so it does not affect your uh, and i know this from a lot of patients experience who who have taken a uh, raw diet and then their digestive system is affected yeah it's, it's interesting you mentioned how even cucumber affects i mean I've just picked our first cucumber from our allotment and oh my God, it was so tasty. I can eat cucumber quite a bit. Yet my father, it just reacts. He just reacts. Same family, same kind of genes and it reacts. So 100%. Yeah. What else can people not eat or should um, uh, think about, I should say? So any food which is dry and spicy also will increase vata. So, uh, for example, spices, uh, red chilies, uh, or any kind of chilies will increase vata as well as pitta. So that is why they are flammable combination. Uh, so it is to really to find out, you know, what if those of you who are interested to find out about the body mind constitution, fill in the form that mm -hmm. I have on my website. Then I send you the list of all the foods in the world probably are on that list, the ones which are good for you and which are not good for you. And then you start to slowly adjust. It will take you probably about a year or so to really understand your body-mind constitution and to work with it. Because it's not just knowing body-mind constitution. It's then to use all those foods and how much quantity and how much combination, yeah. how, what kind of combination. And your body-mind constitution and foods change according to seasons as well. So, you know, it's just adding another another layer to it. So, yeah, it is according to your body and mind constitution. Foods generally which are cold and dry, uh, they will increase vata. So and for, it will make you more anxious. So, so for those of you who are wondering, how do I find out my body, mind, body constitution? Well, the body constitution, the way you find out is complete the questionnaire that Dr. Ashish has mentioned. I will post it or she will post it later on after the live recording is over so just uh, look at the description um wherever you're watching and the description of it or the comments and you will find the link so all right let, let's talk about some of the foods that and we, we're not going to go into too much detail because i'll do a separate episode just listing some of the things you can eat so let's talk about some of the calming or opposite anti-anxiety type of foods people can eat that will be very useful 
So one of the things that calms the nervous system or the vata is the oil and the fat, right? So any kind of, that's why massage works because massage is actually when it works on your body, we have nervous system in our skin. So oil is the best remedy to calm your nervous system via massage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the same principle when you're eating. Uh, so foods which are rich in, say, essential fatty acids, yeah, oily fish, for example, and other foods which are oily rich, uh, they will work really well to bring you to, it's like grinding yourself with a lot mm -hmm. of fat, you know. When we eat fatty food, we feel heavy, don't we, with a lot of cheese and carbs and but if it is healthier, I'm talking about healthier version of it. Uh, so, so, taking, so what, what, what kind of oils? Uh, any kind of oils that we are, but uh, cold pressed virgin oils are the best. If we are taking, uh, whether it's olive oil or ghee you, you are taking or any other cooking oil that you take, uh, it has to be pure oil. So no vegetable oil, no refined oil no uh, mixed oil of any kind uh, and olive oil when you use olive oil i've seen this in the supermarket especially indian pakistani all those supermarkets it's where it says olive oil but it is actually not olive oil it has been mixed with a lot of refined oil so please check the ingredients properly uh, and that will help you to warm up your system yeah if you okay. eat, even if you have to take a spoonful of sesame oil for example yeah, bedtime. If you're having a lot of anxiety issues, then half a teaspoon or full teaspoon, depending on your body weight and everything else, uh, take it bedtime with milk or non-dairy milk. Um, that will help you to sleep and bring your nervous system stable. So so uh, in my own practice, as in what I, what I do, I'm talking about, is coconut oil, uh, virgin, yeah. cold pressed. Uh, yeah. I use extra virgin cold pressed olive oil for salads and anything cold um yeah. but not extra virgin for cooking and what's the other one ghee ghee is amazing for cooking so those three definitely i know work and the others uh, I, I, I keep well away so uh, a couple of things which are actually worth bearing in mind that will make you anxious is coffee now I do drink coffee, but but the yeah. timing of it is important. Yes. I only drink coffee at the latest two o'clock, at the real latest three o'clock, but usually ten o'clock. Ten o'clock in the morning, not before ten. There's a reason for that. The reason is that your body is producing cortisol, which is basically, as far as you're concerned, the wake up hormone. If you're gonna wait, have coffee straight away, then you're not allowing your body to do its natural thing. So I'd wait till after 10 before I have my first coffee. I usually have one, maximum two in a day, but usually one. And I take coffee breaks as in I don't have coffee for several days. So that's one thing. The other thing I found very calming is this taking chamomile tea and in fact, any kind of chamomile product. So for example, if you got a chamomile, proper chamomile essence oil, just at nighttime, massage, massaging that into the feet. Yeah, essential oil. And you mentioned, um, talk to me about turmeric, because a lot of people, particularly in the West, have turmeric as an answer to everything. What are your thoughts on turmeric? Turmeric, turmeric for what? For anxiety? Yep. <laughs> no, turmeric doesn't work for anxiety overall. Uh, it's a great liver herb that we use. It's a wonderful herb anti-cancerous properties it's amazing for that it it cleanses your liver it cleanses your blood it's an anti-infective herb but for anxiety not really it's not really an anti-anxiety herb um but i know everybody is using you know uh, for example turmeric but not for anxiety okay not for anxiety so one of the things that definitely it depends on the time of the year, of course. You've got seasonal affective disorder, which in essence, sad, uh, happens in the UK, anyway, in the Northern Hemisphere. From about October through to about March, we've got much shorter daylights. And, and in fact, in the plant kingdom, particularly in the UK, you can't really grow most foods. I know that because I grow foods. So between October and then now, what I take during, during the summer, like today, last couple of weeks, you don't need no supplement, no specific food for it. Vitamin D3, so much sunshine. And you've got it for free. You've got the one of the most best medication ever for free. Don't ever do it if you're white skin, by the way, uh, if you're very pale. If you're dark skin, you need to do 
a lot more than people with white skin. So just yeah. keep that in mind. But vitamin D3, I actually go for the supplements when it comes to October. Now, it's not the darkest month as yet. However, you need to build up your vitamin D3 levels yeah. in your fat stores. And if I was suggesting to anyone, and oh, by the way, it's brilliant for lung health. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's brilliant for lung health. So if you want to protect your lung health, I emphasize the word lung health, <laughs> take vitamin D3. But not only that, because I think, like I said, I'll do I'll do another short episode just talking about the individual topics. Um, the other area that a lot of people do not address is actually sunlight. Mm. We are not designed to be awake during the night. And we're not designed to sleep during the day. And so if you're somebody who says, oh, I'm a night owl, I wake up late. Well, you're doing a lot of disservice to yourself. And we've mentioned this in previous episodes. If you want to deal with anxiety, one of the best things you can do first thing in the morning at about sunrise. So when the sun starts to come up, I'm sure you know what sunrise means. I don't know why I said that. I was about this time sun's about to come up. <laughs> Uh, we don't have a little kids watching so during sunrise look towards the sun not at the sun towards the sun not at the sun though the early morning sunrise you have to be outside the glass stops these ultraviolet rays from coming in so a window won't work you have to be outside winter or summer it doesn't matter early morning sunrise getting this uh, sunrise first five ten minutes of it is magic potion for you it's going to help you sleep and if you do not sleep properly, for many reasons, but if you do not sleep properly, then you need to wake up early to get that sunlight because 16 hours after you've had that sunrise dose. So if it's in winter and sunrise at, I don't know, 8 a.m., which it is at some point in the UK, at 8 a.m., 16 hours at, after 8 a.m. is midnight. And by midnight, you'll have a lot of melatonin, you will feel very drowsy, you will fall asleep. So but the other thing we want to talk about as well is sleep. Yeah. There are people, uh, recently I rewatched the movie Iron Lady about Margaret Thatcher, and I remember back in the day when she was prime minister, she'd have four, five, six hours sleep. And <laughs> she kind of destroyed her country with some of her decision making. So if you think that you can sleep three, four, five, six hours, think again yeah you are not that special i don't care what age you are kids need even more teenagers probably sometimes 10 12 14 hours by the way so if you do not sleep the following day you're waking up groggy have you noticed how moody you are how reactive you are you snap at people so you start impacting your physical relationship you make decisions and every micro decision you make will create your ultimate reality, your destiny, every micro decision. So if you're anxious, don't make decisions. Calm yourself down first. Um, is there anything else you want to add to, uh, about sleep, Ashish? Uh, no, sleep is important as far as uh, anxiety is concerned. If you are not sleeping very well and you already have anxiety about something or you have developed anxiety over the years or you are naturally an anxious and worrying kind of person or even a pessimistic person that you think of the problem first uh, then you need to sleep even more because that is the time when your nervous system is going to restore itself and if you're not sleeping well then your anxiety is going to increase many many forms depending on how less sleep you are having i mean from time to time you can you can abuse your body and you can abuse your body for some time when you are younger you have bounce back factor you bounce back much faster uh, however eventually your body will catch up your body and mind will catch up and you cannot always have such less sleep as to two three hours or even sleeping later much later two o'clock three o'clock and then waking up uh, that also affects the sleep cycle so it is not just only the duration, it's sleeping on time is crucial because that leads on to your nervous system being, you know, hyper energy because it did not have the time to rest. So so one of the 
issues that I, I I deal with on a daily basis with people with type 2 diabetes. And by the way, hello to everybody who is commenting and saying hello, Anna Greta, Palmy, Lisa, and everybody else, Teresa, everyone who's saying hello Hi, on fa 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 Facebook. Uh, hello to you. And if you're not saying hello, what the hell's wrong with you? Be nice. You're getting <laughs> this for free, right? You're not, we're not charging you our full prices or any price. So be nice. Say hello. So, right. So <laughs> I'd say this in jest, but I also feel that as humans, you know, I know we got like uh, the internet in between us and the, we're not in the physical space. It's always nice to say hello. So one of the big issues I deal with is people with type 2 diabetes. And I was a pre-diabetic until that, and my parents were diabetic as well. And so how do you deal with that? Now, there's a direct implication for someone who's got diabetes and sleep. And here's what happens. Sugar is one of your worst enemies. It's not the worst enemy. <laughs> it's one of your worst enemies. You are your worst enemy, by the way, if you want to find out who that is. So sugar, if you eat anything which is simple carbs and sugar, well, if you eat anything at nighttime anyway, but let's just say sugar. And, and I recently, inadvertently, had a slice of mango. It's Pakistani mango, Alfonso mango, and I had a, two slices of the mango, then I admit it. I'd frozen it, I had that my God, I couldn't sleep. I had to go to the toilet so many times because of the sugar content. What it does is it stresses your body. Your cortisol level goes up. Your yeah. insulin level goes up. Your blood sugar level goes up. So don't have anything sugary, anything sweet. In the UK, in the British culture, they have dessert after a main meal. It's not doing you any good. So Ashish, when is the best time to stop eating? Oh, uh, right. So that, again, you know, it's it's all linked. Um, if you're having late dinner, if you're having too much sugar or dessert, um, sugar in the form of dessert, and it is later than seven o'clock, then one, that you're not digesting well. Secondly, that you're spiking up your sugar levels too much. It is going to affect your sleep. And then all of this is going to make you more anxious and hyper the following day and if this has been your lifestyle for some time whether it's few months few years then you can imagine the kind of vicious cycle that you have developed for yourself and it is um you know sugar overall doesn't make you anxious but if there is no balance if you're not doing a balancing act and you're not having other healthy foods to balance it then it will definitely make you hyper and of course, with the tendency for if you have a predisposition or there is genetic and hereditary tendency to have type 2 diabetes or even type 1, then it makes you a little bit more nervous because sugar affects the nervous system. We know what happens with um, uh, nervous system when it gets when sugar is too high and all the nervous system or the peripheral nervous system is affected and we cannot feel anything in our extremities it's because all the nerves can get damaged with too much sugar so that is why there is a link between having excessive sugar and feeling this hyperness you know and that can add to your anxiety if you're already anxious person it will add more to that so so for those of you who don't understand the seriousness of what dr she said this is what she's saying I'll translate in, into <laughs> I'm, even... I'm talking in English, I think. <laughs> into basic English. You're absolutely talking in English. But I think the okay. implication, here's the implications. When you've got issues with your nervous system, your peripheral nerves, meaning the ones at the ends of your body. So peripheral nerves include hands, feet, and eyes, believe it or not. Here's what happens. When those nerve cells die, you start losing sensation you get tingling feeling for some people other people feel like they're walking on hot sand or a gritty feeling that's the hands and the feet and the eyes you start losing the ability to see yeah. so 10 percent of the world's blind people are people who've had type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes um and and so blindness comes directly from that people who've got peripheral nerve damage in their legs what also happens is it means less oxygen also is getting there. As a result, many of them develop gangrene. And I can't remember the exact numbers. I think there are about 300 or so people in the UK every single week in England, every week have their legs or arms amputated, cut off, 
as a result of nerve damage and it's had infection. So it's actually, it's actually, so when I say sugar is a poison, I ain't messing about with my words. It's, it's something very, very serious. So please, please, please. It's, look, it's not that you need simple sugars. You can have berries, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, all of those in moderate quantities. But all the other stuff, the fizzy drinks, the chocolate bars, which I was addicted to, the fizzy drinks that I was addicted to, just to let you know, I don't do them anymore. All of those things are destroying your nervous system and organs and as a result, causing anxiety and depression. So when yeah. you're high, you're, when you're creating so much stress in your body, you're not going to have, uh, you're going to have problems sleeping. So if you notice, viewers, if you notice this, you'll find that when somebody is super anxious, they have something called an anxiety attack. How do they breathe? They're breathing like this, aren't they? <laughs> right, like Harry met Sally movement, like you know, very, very, very shallow, very shallow. And some people to the point, and I've seen it, <laughs> I've seen actually a, um, a student at a school who actually hyperventilates on purpose to the point that oh. she fainted. She does it on purpose of that one, you know, for attention. Um, for attention, yeah. Even yeah. kids can do it. Even babies yeah. do that. Yeah. yeah. So you hyperventilate. That means you're not breathing properly. So the opposite of that is breathing properly. Let's talk about pranayama, Ashish. <laughs> Our favorite topic. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, that that's the beauty of natural and holistic medicine. And breath work is crucial. It's crucial, crucial to everything to do with your mind. And you have to notice, start noticing when you are anxious or you're thinking a lot and you're just feeling, you know, too much uh, anxiety about something. Notice your breathing pattern, how you are breathing. As Harun just mentioned, it is very shallow. You're just up here. It's not even going further down. And just by changing your breath, taking it much more deeper, even if you don't know anything else, how to do any other form of pranayama, just taking it deeper down to your belly. Just breathe in as if your breath is going all the way to the abdomen, filling your abdomen, making it bigger and taking it out from there. You will find straight away it calms you down. Yeah. It's, so pranayam, uh, as we say, prana means life and you are bringing life with all that oxygen that we breathe in. Without that, we all will be dead. And learning to do breath work is crucial, I think, in today's day and age, uh, you know, considering how many people and children and adults and youngsters who, who are waiting for their exams results must be so anxious right now. Uh, they can do this breath work. Breath work means where you slow your breathing down, especially for anxiety. You don't want to do a few things that I mentioned. So one is that you do, anybody who suffers from anxiety shouldn't be doing any pranayam after four or five o'clock in the evening. You don't want to excite your nervous system. You want to calm it down. So any pranayam breath work you want to do, it should be in the first half of the day or up till maximum five o'clock. Uh, and secondly, that you want to slow it down as slow as possible, as boring as possible for your body to just slowing, slowing, slowing your breath down and that's the hardest bit to do because when you're anxious you're hyper like this you know and then to calm it down but you need to slow it down um so yeah slow breath work uh, any kind of slow pranayam normally i teach what i call alternate nostril breathing so you breathe in from right and you take out from the left and then you breathe in from the left and take out from the right really simple to do but I kid you not how many people cannot do this. They just get confused between right and left. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's mind boggling to me. It's, it's the simplest pranayam to do. Uh, and the slower you do it, so you can count one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then one, two, three, four, five. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can count to slow your uh, mind. Yeah, brilliant. absolutely brilliant. And um, so exercise, if you're someone who's suffering from anxiety and depression, one of the most important things you've got to do is exercise. But not all exercises were created the same. And we'll do a different episode on some one of the devices I use. But for now, let's just say 
the equipment that I use is something called BioWell, which actually measures the activity of your sympathetic nervous system, which is to do with your activation system, your fight or flight system. So it measures that uh, sympathetic. And then the parasympathetic, which is your relaxation, your calming system. If you're suffering from anxiety, you need a balance of both, no two ways about it. However, here's what I found. Even the most, <laughs> how can I say, people who think they've got it together, the system doesn't lie in terms of the measurements. What I found is that you need a balance between your different organs, so your kidneys. You need some parasympathetic, some sympathetic nervous system activity going. But here's what I found, that most people, especially if they're anxious, of course, they are their sympathetic nervous system is up there. So yes, mm -hmm. do exercise, but be very mindful of what kind of exercise. So HIIT exercises, what's that going to do? Take a sympathetic nervous system through the roof. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, <coughs> but if you're suffering from anxiety, you need exercise, but it's a different kind. If you do the gym workout, you need your heart to really go for it when you because you're going to be pushing heavy weights or if you're doing light weights and you're doing loads you're still working on the sympathetic nervous system and so there's very few exercises out there which will work your parasympathetic nervous system and our other favorite topic we're going to talk about is the the practice of yoga yoga okay so how does yoga work with the parasympathetic nervous system because i the uniqueness of yoga is that it is it should be. I don't know where you are learning or, or other people are learning their yoga from. Yoga sh should and must always be done with your breath. Yeah. So you breathe in, you move one way, you breathe out, you move other way. You have to have breath awareness. If you are not doing it with the breath awareness, then it's a simple exercise. It is not yoga. And by doing that, you are working with your body's permission. So it helps you to balance both sides of your nervous system. Yeah, breathe in, breathe out, and you can balance both sides rather than just, because if you think about any other gym exercise, you don't think about breath as much. You're just pumping it, pumping it, working against your body, and that's how you build the muscle because it's against the resistance. Uh, your body's res resistance, that's how body gets built up. But we also need to balance it, especially uh, when we are talking about uh, from anxiety point of view, so yoga works really well with that. Some form of restorative yoga, some form of grounding yoga, some form of grounding breath work is crucial. Doesn't matter how much other stuff you do, how much hit, do whatever you want to do, but balance it out. So, so why do you believe, I believe it anyway, uh, that in the case of someone's got a lot of anxiety, hot yoga is probably not the best pathway? No, not at all. You're going to feel more anxious being in that environment of hot and sweaty. So, uh, no, Bikram Yoga, it's what it used to be called before uh, because he started it. Uh, but, yeah, you can call it any hot environment where you're doing it. It's not good for Pitta. If you are a Pitta constitution, you're going to feel really hot. So you need to have so much water content afterwards to rehydrate your body as well. That's one. Secondly, is the vata. Vata is going to go completely out of whack if because both of those going to get, um, yeah, increased uh, so, with hot yoga. <laughs> so, so I wish I'd met you years ago because I, in 2016, I was living in Solid Hall and the only yoga places available are, were two places and they both did hot yoga. And so I, I joined one of them, which was uh, about half an hour or 20 minute walk from my house. I just used to walk there and walk back. Yeah. And they did a special deal, 20 pounds first month. You can go to as many classes as you want. And of course, running my own business, I thought I'd sneak in. And, you know, uh, like as in, you know, I'll sneak in a session uh, every day. I did that every day. First three, four days was fine. Then every single day thereafter, in the middle of the day, I had to sleep for another two hours. I was so exhausted, literally, yeah. as if I'd been on a... Just well, I was drinking a lot of water, but it still wasn't working. You know, all that water that I'm drinking, I was absolutely shattered. But of course, I'm fat and bitter combination, yeah. um, exactly. which is exactly the wrong combination to do hot yoga. So again, it's not that hot yoga is bad for you. It's just that if you're suffering, if you're someone vata bitter, like uh, Dr. She said, or 
you're somebody who's going through anxiety, depression, it's probably not the best environment. However, keep in mind, so there's lots of other forms of yoga. You want, like Dr. She says, the restorative type. So there are yoga teachers out there who teach the highly active stuff and the more restorative, always go for the restorative. That's what you need. Most importantly, of course, that it is important that you exercise your body. If you don't exercise your body, meaning if you are not give, doing physical activity, you're going to create anxiety in your body because the body is not designed to sit on the backside, you know, like us. Well, she's just standing. I, I need to go one of those, <laughs> uh, uh, one of those um, desks that go up and down. So, uh, yeah, so it's very important that your body is moving, is moving. So moving on to that, anxiety. Some people are predisposed to it, of course, for biological reasons. Yeah. Many, many people are predisposed to it because of childhood trauma. In the first zero to seven, from zero to seven, first seven years of your life, let's just say 99% of all the programming that's going to ever happen, meaning the algorithms that are created in your mind, in your subconscious mind, is going to happen then, 99%. And this will happen because of your interaction between your mom and dad, your observations between behaviors between your mom and dad, words, energy, etc., how they are towards each other, your observations of other people, traumas, and it could be trauma as little as, no, don't go near the fire. And to a child, that might be a trauma because it shocked them. So a child hears the word no about 400 times on, uh, on average per day. And some of it is genuinely good reason. Say, no, don't go and touch those hot cake or hot cookie or whatever but that's still a no but they only hear a handful a handful of yeses in the day so it makes the child very anxious and you know i, I watched a video recently um you got this whole thing with gen z with all the challenges that i've got and this young lady who's 20 years old she said are you surprised why we're so challenged we were born we were the first generation who were born post 9-11, and this is American, of course, um, and we've been at school once a year, shown all the videos of people jumping off buildings and dying, and us thinking the whole country's been traumatized, uh, it's the worst thing that's ever happened, and we've had the mass shootings and blah, 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 all the lists, and I thought, oh my God, that really makes sense, why Gen Z, the younger generation, I mean, you know, a lot of us uh, older people think, you know, what the hell is wrong with them? But the truth is, it's a perception of trauma. They've been subjected to so much trauma through the media. Media is not a good thing. The mainstream media is not good. I don't have a television in my house. I really don't have time. I've got too much of life to enjoy to have television. But most people don't understand that. They have television and they're exposed to this stuff. However, in order to work on your traumas, there's layers. The layer one, which is the one that you will see, is simple stuff like what you're eating, your sleep or your lack of sleep, how people are, your environment. Layer two are your behaviors. Layer three, now we're getting deep. So as you come down, environment, behaviors, layer three are the skill sets that you have. So say, for example, if you don't know, very simple exercise, if you don't know how to breathe properly, you've just been demonstrated just now, alternate nostril breathing, um, the way she's described it, meaning longer out breath, activates your sympathetic nervous system. So the next layer of, if you want to change your levels of anxiety, is to learn skills and turn them into habits, which yeah. is basically are behaviors. And that's how you change it. But then the next level down is your values and your beliefs, because your values and your beliefs will yeah. determine your perception. So if the values, if your beliefs are, for example, your beliefs are, let's use this Gen Z example, oh my God, terrorists are out to get us, then you're going to see the world through the eyes of victimhood. It's very important to understand, you're going to see the eyes of victimhood. And if, if you've ever read any book, if you're ever going to read any book about consciousness, read the book called Power Versus Force by Dr. David R. Hawkins. I interviewed him many years ago, before he, just before he passed away, actually. And he talks about the map of consciousness. And so when you're operating from this level of anxiety, 
you're in essence being driven by fear. Yeah. Fear of what may happen. It's not fear of what's happening. It's fear of what may happen. What that does is gets you to contract your energy, contract your energy field, contract it literally, contract your DNA. It's going to accelerate your aging. So in order to shift that, that's when you need to have the therapy. Everybody needs therapy, by the way. There's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. 30 years ago, if you if someone told you, you know, if you told someone that you were having therapy, that they'd say, what, you're a Hollywood actress or something? Why do you, what do you, what do you, you're a drama queen? Why do you need therapy? Everybody needs therapy because everyone's been traumatized. I've not met one single person, and I know loads. I've not met one single person who's not been traumatized. So then you work at that next, so that next level is working on your values and your beliefs. And you can work that, work those kind of things with general practitioners. But then if you want to go to the next level, which is the identity, which is now saying, Instead of calling yourself, I am an anxious person, or even, even I have PTSD, you separate your identity. So I am Haroon. I am experiencing symptoms. So you're separating that out. Big mistake, like with diabetes, for example, and the mainstream do this naturally. Instead of saying, what they're told to say is, oh, I'm a diabetic. So that means... Uh, this is who I am. This is how what defines me. So instead of doing that, if you know anything to do with the work of Dr. Gabo Mate, who, funnily enough, he does the same kind of work I do, except from a different perspective. If you look at that kind of work, you'll see that diabetes or any kind of chronic disease, anxiety is merely a process. Please listen up. It's merely a process. It's merely your body and your mind's way of saying, hey, Pay attention. Pay attention. You're having this anxiety. Pay attention that you are out of balance. You need to pay attention to what's going on in your mind, in your body. So the anxiety isn't a bad thing. It's actually telling you, wake up. Something's not working for you. And very often, it's very rarely that we can figure this out. This is where you turn to someone like myself or Dr. Ashish and you say, okay, help me with this. And then the final layer, which is really the deepest layer, and again, people like us, is saying, okay, my spiritual level, the consciousness level, what's really going on here? Now, you go to the deep origin story. So if you say, for example, somebody goes out on a date, you're about to go on a date with someone for the first time uh, in a long time. And you're feeling very anxious and nervous. In fact, you cancel the date and you avoid people like the plague. If we track it back, you'll find the first seven to seven years of your life, something happened where you met someone new. It could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be that, it could be a teacher, it doesn't matter who it is. You met someone, and in that moment, you had a humiliation. Somebody made you feel scared. Somebody made you feel upset. But basically, that trauma kicked in. And then throughout your life, you've avoided meeting new people because of that one trauma. But here's what happens, my friend. When you go back to the origin story, and I do this with my clients. When you go back to the origin story, you go, okay, what's really happened? Oh, wow. So I'll, I'll use one of my own examples where... I felt humiliated by my own father, actually, um, at a religious school, publicly. And what it did for me is think, why would he behave like this? This is when I did my own therapy. Why would he behave like this? And I thought, what was the lesson for me? The lesson for me is not to conform, not to be like anybody else. Lesson number one. Number two, lesson number two is not worry about other people's opinions about me. Guess what it did? It turned out making that trauma into one of my strongest ace cards, which is this authenticity, my number one value, authenticity. How you see me now, joking, bantering. I've I've had clients in the past who wanted to commit suicide. I also joke and banter with them. This is authenticity. When you're authentically yourself, and I bring it on to, I don't know how I ended up with authenticity, but this links back. When you're authentic to your mind, your body, that means what goes into your mouth as well, and exercise, when you're authentic and integral yeah. with that, integral with your spirit, then you are healthy. 
When you're out of integrity, you are no longer authentic. That's when you fall ill. Simple. End of the lesson. I think we can end the podcast there. No, joking. <laughs> no. So authenticity is important. So it's very important. What level do you want to play at? What level do you, and I say play because it's a play. If you work yeah. purely on the symptomatic level, and it's important to address the symptoms. If you're in an anxiety attack right now, drink chamomile tea, sleep earlier, stay in bed longer, stop watching television. These are all symptoms. But once you've calmed yourself down, remember there'll be triggers that will repeat itself yeah. because your mind, the spirit, the universe is telling you, pay attention. Is there anything you want to add to that? <laughs> <laughs> I think you you had uh, your own <laughs> podcast there. But it, it, it's great. Yes, you have to go deeper and deeper. Where is that anxiety coming from? Especially if it is affecting you uh, and, you know, hampering your life and your standard of living and causing you disease, which it will. If anxiety is out of hand, it will cause some form of disease at some point or even great, bigger disease as well. So, yes, looking at much deeper level where it is coming from and what are you afraid of? That's what anxiety is about. As you said, it is uh, being fearful of. But this is not something that you're going to think once. And even if you have done some work for some time, you, as Harun said, you will find triggers. Triggers are always going to be there because we, we have to live in the world. You know, we're not leaving this planet yet. So... It is about learning how to then balance those triggers as well. When you hear that something uh, that triggers your anxiety, then how to balance. That's why it's important to have all these habits, consistent habits about food, about sleep, about your mindset. And mindset is crucial to change your anxiety habit. Yeah, something it's, that you learned and then to change it. Yeah, I, I nearly forgot to mention earlier on that. Uh, so recently I did a retreat of my clients um, that I was working with. He, we used the BioWorld to measure his organ systems. And some of them, and I, he's given me permission to talk about it. I won't talk about it in too much detail. Um, some of the organs were at hypo level, meaning underperforming. And if you go too much into the underperformance area, that organ in essence is dying. It's not, yeah. it's not, it's not a good sign. Some of them were hyper performing. We also able to measure the balance of the energy centers called the chakras. So you can measure that and you can see the, so in this particular device, it basically in essence, what it means is how is this psychological balance? Now his blood sugar had gone up. He'd been eating all the right foods He'd been doing 10,000 steps every single day and he was getting better night's sleep. And yet his blood sugars had gone up. His heart rate had gone up significantly. And so we measured everything. On paper, it looked like he was doing all the right things. And the only thing that could have been possible cause of his blood sugar going through the roof, heart rate going up, pulse rate going up and so on, was his stress levels. And so here's what I did. I got him, and we did it in four different occasions, separate days. I got him to, I did some readings, and then I got him to do some pranayama exercise, so breath work. For about 90 seconds, 90 seconds, not even two minutes, not even, certainly not five minutes, 90 seconds, I got him to do different exercises at different days. And straight away, I kid you not, all the chakras came into balance. All the organs that seemed to be hypo went into less than hyper. So he went closer to optimal. His energy levels, his stress levels dropped significantly. Over time, over the five days, it got better and better. In essence, every single time, I get him to do exercise first and measure. And then eight minutes later, measure again and see how quickly his body's reacting. And then get him to do breath work. So don't for one second think that breathing isn't important. In fact, stop breathing for a day. Let's in fact stop breathing for 10 minutes, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> see what see what happens. And, 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 and let's see how you feel by the end of it. You be into the highest state of consciousness. You will no longer be part of the same physical body. So breath work, I kid you not, with jokes aside. It is super, super important. So we've come to the end of today's episode just to remind you. You're watching the Harun Rabbani podcast. And we're with myself, Harun Rabbani, and Dr. Ashish Paul. However, 
we feel this has been so much fun. And whilst the Harun Rabani podcast will focus on whatever comes to mind, primarily diabetic uh, stuff, um, what we're doing is we're launching in September, we're launching the Natural Medicine Podcast. Natural Medicine Podcast, we're going to share with you. We're going to go even into more detail. We're going to cover mind, body, spirit, health, all to do with, you know, like general health issues, specific health issues, including autoimmune diseases, chronic diseases, and so on, across the board, including stuff like Crohn's disease, including stuff like um, multiple sclerosis, infertility, PCOS. We'll mention type 2 diabetes, of course. So we're going to... Yeah. Um, sorry, you can say? No, I said we are coming to those topics. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to be covering a lot of topics, but we want to make this podcast this new podcast your podcast it's not about us because Ashish and i just can pick up the phone and have a joke and a laugh and talk about these things <laughs> without sharing with anyone and we do anyway we thought we might as well record it or might as well live stream it so this is not for us this is for you you know we're already getting plenty of entertainment so this is to really inspire educate inform so that yeah. we can give make medicine natural medicine as cost effective if not free as possible for you the truth is this most people in hospitals have got diseases that could have been prevented in the first place or healed naturally yeah healed naturally without the side effects if you'd like to be part of our little community here's what you do comment in the comment section wherever you're watching whether it's on youtube linkedin or facebook comment natural medicine podcast and then what i'll do is i'll take your name down because obviously if you're watching this video then i know you or dr Ashish knows you we'll take your name down and then we'll let you know uh where to subscribe so we can then let you know in the launches i would love for you 100 people 200 300 people at least to come to the launch um episode and we'll do that live and i hope you can join us so if you've enjoyed this make sure you like make sure you love make sure you comment make sure you thank dr she she can thank me if you want as well i don't mind um for this contribution thank you once again for watching next time we will be talking more stuff about natural medicine same time same place next week thank you for watching bye for now <laughs> Bye bye